I say, I've worked for over 20 years in the polar regions doing research. I've also had the pleasure of working with documentary makers on planet Earth, did some work on Blue Planet and also Frozen Planet as well. But I'm still really excited about what the polar regions can teach us. And in the concept of uh, sustainability, it, implicit in lots of the things that we've heard today has been about boundaries and where we draw boundaries in systems. And uh, when you think of the Antarctic or the polar regions, you tend to think of these classically beautiful environments like this. But you're talking about things to scale of continents. They're not all like that. Parts of the Antarctic look a bit like this, which is a particularly grim place. But I got a job on a tour ship, and we were guiding passengers, and they wanted to go ashore. And we end up walking over this environment that looks a bit like the surface of the moon. The passengers loved it. They wandered around enjoying the, you know, the desolation, the isolation, the feeling that they're in this untouched wilderness that no one had ever been in before. While I was standing on the beach, I noticed something glinting on the floor amongst the pebbles. I bent down and looked, and it was a tooth. It was a tooth of a crab-eater seal. And I looked around, and the more I looked, the more I could see these teeth. Now, crab-eater seal teeth are really interesting. It's the most highly evolved mammal tooth, and they use it to feed. But the whole area is littered with these teeth. And I'm thinking, well, why are these seal teeth around? And then I noticed a sort of rusty streak amongst some pebbles. So I walked over, dug around a bit. And there was actually a stake in the ground. And that stake would have been left there by a dog team that come through, stake out the huskies, then they'd killed seals, butchered them, and fed them to the dogs. And the numbers of teeth that were littered among the rocks, it was obviously a big room. So the passengers on this tour ship were thinking they're in this environment that no one's ever been to before. But actually it's an, you know, a, a sustainable ecological challenge that's gone on right in this area. So when people think about the Antarctic and the polar regions as being these untouched places, it's absolutely not true. This is an island called South Georgia, and the numbers in those boxes are the numbers of blue whales caught in just one month in 1926. I worked around South Georgia for a decade on the research ships at James Park Ross, and I've seen two blue whales in all that time. These were the number they were catching. The picture on the right shows the scale of the industrial uh, interactions that were going on when they were processing these whales. And that's a picture of that whaling station at the watercolour was just a few years ago. But the point is, people get an idea, they talk about wilderness, wildernesses and untouched regions, but all of the accessible regions of Antarctica, almost all of them, have been exploited from the very first contact that we ever had with them. Now in the Arctic, it's more complicated because in the 16th and 17th century, when the developed world started heading north, the first thing they bumped into was indigenous peoples that have been sustainably exploiting their environment for a very, very long time, thousands of years. Now, uh, when you look at the folk memory that we have in the developed world, English-speaking world particularly, it's all filled with these stories of peril and hardship, how difficult the weather is, how hard the conditions are. But at the same time, there's this implicit irony that they're justifiably famous for being fantastically beautiful, full of animals and full of wildlife. And people really put together the fact that how come the wildlife do so well, yet it seems to be so difficult for humans there? So when you study and teach about the, the polar regions, you can use them to explain how the animals have adapted. Now the two regions are quite different. On the left hand side you've got the Arctic, the ancient Greeks called it Arctos. The ancient Greeks also came up with the concept of Antarctos the anti-Arctic, the opposite to the Arctic, which, was, which must balance it. Of course, they never discovered the Antarctic, but they've probably been surprised at just how geographically opposite the two places are. If you look at the North Pole, on the left-hand side there, on the North Pole, you've got an ocean. The Arctic is an ocean surrounded by land, and that ocean is covered with ice. It's just a couple of metres thick. But the really thick ice in, Green, in the Arctic, you have to look at places like Greenland, where the ice is a couple of kilometres thick, and some of the smaller islands dotted around the north of Canada. When you go to the Antarctic, completely the opposite. You've got this giant continent the size of Europe that's covered with ice up to four and a half kilometers thick and then an ocean around the edge. So one is an ocean surrounded by land, the other is land surrounded by an ocean. But what difference does that make to the climate? On the bottom axis here, you've got month of the year. On the vertical axis, there's temperature. If you look at the black line first, that's the temperature, the mean temperature at a place called Alert, which is in northern Canada. If you look at the seasonal cycle, you see this nice, smooth cycle that looks like this. And it's the sort of things that we get in Europe, if you average a lot of data. It's a nice, round seasonal cycle. Now, if you look at the red line, that's the mean atmospheric temperature data for 50 years of data recorded at South Pole. So it's a very reliable measurement. 
starts off in the height of summer in the Antarctic at South Pole, minus 30. And then within a couple of months, it drops to minus 60. And then the temperature flatlines before it rises again in the Antarctic spring. Completely different to what's going on in the Arctic. You get this kind of squashed U-shape rather than this nice smooth seasonal cycle. When you're doing research into the polar regions, if you want to understand that picture, why the two are different, what you learn from that is the reason that we ended up with an ozone hole that was discovered first in the Antarctic is because of that meteorological signature that you can see there. You get this super cold air that sits around for a long time. And that doesn't develop in the Arctic, only in certain key places. Now, when those huge seasonal cycles of 30 degrees are going on, 30 degrees temperature change, Antarctica, for example, the ice grows and expands away from the continent really, really quickly. And over the course of the year, you end up with it virtually doubling before it retreats again. Now, the same thing's going on in the Arctic, but of course it's six months out of phase. And that's why you often hear the, the people talking about heartbeats of the planet when you see this ice growing and melting. So the animals, over a course of their lifetime, have got to endure these huge seasonal changes of 30 to 40 degrees C and the changing environment that looks a bit like this. So the way the animals have adapted to cope with that is, this is a polar bear of course, they have the most fantastic fur and fat that you can imagine. Super efficient at keeping all the heat with inside the animal. At the same time, some of the animals like penguins and whales have a really good heat countercurrent system. If you look at the plot on the left hand side first, look at the red blood, where the red blood is going. It starts off in the core of the body, goes through the blubber towards the skin, and it, as soon as the blood's at the skin it starts to cool off. But then it returns and goes back through the blubber. But you see in the schematic, I've got the blood that's returning that's cold is adjacent to the blood that's leaving that's warm. So there's a very big heat exchange that's going on, which is the sorts of things we've heard in other talks today. So the animal keeps its core body temperature within the body. If you look at the right-hand plot and the flipper of that dolphin, you can see it's even cleverer than the schematic I showed. The blood leaving the body goes down the middle, and the blood returning goes up the outside, so it really keeps the heat within the body. And that's the result of that. That's an infrared picture of a polar bear. So if the police were flying around with their infrared cameras like they do in my part of London spotting burglars, <laughs> if you're in the Arctic, you're not going to find a polar bear. And that's one of the, well, you might see just a couple of eyes and a nose. But these are one of the things to explain to the documentary makers. But researchers that have been working on polar bears for a very long time, if you look at the bears, you uh, uh, look at the condition of the bears and you analyse the fats within the bears, what you find is that within the fat of the polar bears, you can see persist persistent organic pollutants. This one is PBDE, which is a fire retardant. So you say to yourself, well, how do fire retardants get into the polar regions, this untouched, isolated environment that nobody knows about? And of course, the reason they get there is because of the ocean carrying the, 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 these that are dissolved in them, or they don't dissolve, but carrying them towards the Arctic, and also by the winds. And if we understand how, and learn and understand how the winds and the ocean are transporting these things around the planet, we can understand a lot about the heat that's being moved around the planet as well. Now, there's nothing special about the polar bears. If you drill down through the ice cap and the Greenland ice cap and look at the things that are, are trapped in the snow on the ice cap in the different layers that make it up, if you dig down uh, not too far, you can find traces of the, uh, of the iron smelting and the lead mining that the Romans were doing you know, 2,000 years ago. It's all trapped there. So the heat is moving around the planet, and that's demonstrated in things like this. Now, we've heard a few times today, uh, it mentioned the planet is warming up, and it is warming up. And when we were working on, for example, Frozen Planet, people were saying, how do you have a television program about the polar regions where you don't talk about climate change until a separate episode? But this picture shows what's actually going on in the Arctic. You can see it's got more red, and the colours indicate that the temperature has uh, 1.2 uh, in the Arctic. 1.2 degrees, it's increased since pre-industrial times. So you're talking about fractions of a degree increase per year, which over 100 years is a, is a lot, and over population dynamics is a lot. But to your individual lemming, which lives on the tundra, and it goes through a temperature cycle of 40 degrees centigrade, it's not a lot. So individual animals don't really, they don't see it in the same way, but the communities of animals and the ecosystems are changing. This was a fantastic piece of work that was published last week. It was published under the banner of greening of the Arctic. And what it shows is the signal of that climate change, this Arctic amplification, we're actually seeing it. So if you look at the coast of um, 
Northern, uh, North America, Canada, and, and, and Alaska. You can see that greeny, bluey color in there. The greeny, bluey color it indicates that the plant growth change is around 5% per decade. And over the last 30 years, this research group in Boston have worked out that the tundra, which is kind of similar to that rocky wilderness picture I showed of the Antarctic in, in lots of ways, the, the parts of it, the, the ecosystems have changed by more than 10% over the last uh, three decades, which is a phenomenal change. Again, the point to individual animals, they feel that in a different way, but the whole system is changing. Another example of that is uh, the relentless increase in temperatures in the Arctic. Is the red colour here on Greenland is showing the part of Greenland that is above zero each summer. And the trend is that as we go further on in time towards now, more and more of Greenland is melting every year at the surface. And a great example of that was in 2012, last summer, when in a couple of days, a weather front passed over Greenland and the whole surface of Greenland, for a very short period of time, started to melt and the satellites observed that. Now this is very interesting because the ice in Greenland is two to three kilometers thick, but people got the impression that the whole ice sheet was melting quite quickly, but it was the surface melt. But understanding what happened to that water is really interesting. There's a couple of researchers, they're actually scientists making measurements. And they're, what they're, they're going along in their canoes, they've got echo sounders on the bottom of the canoes, measuring the depth of uh, those channels and working at the volume of water that's flowing in, getting some bulk calculations for how much meltwater is coming off the surface of Greenland. Now, if you understand where that meltwater is going, you can learn about the hydrology of the glacier, how the glacier is uh, flowing, the water gets down to this bed underneath the glacier and helps it flow. And under certain circumstances, the meltwater at the surface is increasing the rate of the melt uh, of, of the uh, ice. Now, where does that water end up? It ends up in the sea, and then it, the sea level is rising. We know the sea level is rising. Over the next 100 years, the sea level is going to rise by about a metre. Now, is that a good news story or a bad news story? Uh, you know... A metre is quite a lot. You talk to some people and they say, a oh, metre, that's not really much, given that we were told a few years ago that the sea level is going to increase tens of metres. But it's all about rates of change and things like that. And if you look back at the last 150 years, the banks of the River Thames, for example, have been adjusted several times and raised to take into account this gradual change in sea level that we're going to have to cope with. But in the background with all this, of course, we're a developed country. And a developed country, we're quite wealthy. Um, compared with other countries, and it's the countries that can't, don't have the infrastructure and, and the sort of funding we have that are going to have to deal with these sorts of things as well. So I finish up with by saying that the Arctic is going through a massive change at the moment. I've already showed that picture of the greening of the Arctic and the continual climate change. One common definition of the Arctic is the tree line, the northern extent that trees can exist on the tundra. You go past the tree line heading north, then you're in the Arctic. But as the climate is changing and warming up, this tree line is migrating northwards. And the current generation of climate models, it's about, I think it's 17 of these models have shown that in some parts of the Arctic, this tree line is going to move forward over 100 years, over the next 100 years, as much as 250 miles, which is a huge amount of change. And it means that technically the Arctic is shrinking. It means the animals are going to have to move to uh, refuges, some of the animals, and, and as communities, they're going to start migrating and moving around. But one of the issues that we, uh, challenges that we have to address when you're thinking about making uh, climate change programs and making programs about the polar regions, about any part of the environment, is that when you show pictures like this, which this is a fantastic place to be, looking at the sunset go down, which took several hours. But the problem is, is it, it's so unbelievably unrealistic and Narnia-like, you lose the connection that people have got with how, where they think they're connected to these places like the Arctic and the Antarctic. And they get it into uh, their understanding that these places are, uh, are distant and not connected with us and not connected with what we're actually doing. And once they expand their system to realise that things that we actually do are connected with what's going on in the Arctic. If you release uh, fire retardants into the ocean off the coast of Britain, it's going to end up in the Arctic in not too long. Then it will help people understand how they can affect their behaviour and then actually stop these things and, and help uh, plan for the future with how we're going to uh, understand what's going on.
So I think it's really important to keep telling people about the polar regions, and not just the polar regions, the Arctic and the Antarctic, any natural system, but also to be completely honest, in the same way we've heard in many other talks uh, today, about um, these places aren't isolated, they're connected to us. But, uh, but if you understand the rates of change that are going on in the Arctic and the Antarctic, you can also understand the rate of change and how it's going to impact us. And once we understand how it's going to impact us, then we can plan for responses that we need to do to take into account things like sea level. Thank you very much.